I want to encourage you today as we close out this year, and uh, we're going to talk about waiting on the Lord. And uh, let's go ahead and stand and let's read Luke chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 22, and we'll read down to verse 38. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written, the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the, par and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phalul of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. She was, and she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers day, night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Henry, could you lead us in prayer this morning? Amen. You may be seated. Today is the last day of 2023. It is a good day to reflect, but it's also a good day to go forward. I'm not personally big on New Year's resolutions. <laughs> Under the premise of the fact that there is no better day to start towards a new goal than today. However, I recognize that the beginning of a new year is a good place to start again. It seems so natural because tomorrow the year will have one more number. And tomorrow, January, the first month of the year, will start again. Therefore, let us start the new year with a renewing or perhaps a new outlook on reality. In our passage, Joseph, Mary, and the baby Jesus have come to the temple for the presentation of Jesus to the Lord and Mary's purification after she had given birth. Jesus' presentation to the Lord was in accordance with Numbers chapter 18, verse 17. Joseph, and we're not going to read it, but if you want to know where it comes from, that's where it comes from. Joseph would have redeemed Jesus for five shekels of silver. The reason for this is that all the firstborn males of beast and man were the Lord's because of the tenth plague in Egypt. The tenth plague and final plague that God brought against Egypt, those many hundreds, thousands of years before this, was 
the death of the firstborn males. Therefore, God declared that all firstborn males were his. Later, God took the tribe of Levi to be his specific in replacement of the firstborn males. And from that point on, all firstborn males in Israel had to be redeemed. And that's something, believe it or not, that even continues on to this very day. And they still pay five golden, I mean, five silver shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. Mary's purification was in accordance with the law as given in Leviticus chapter 12. And you can read all about the purification of a, of a woman after she had a child. In this particular case, the law, the one that she would have been performing was the one that was required if she had a male child. The male child would be circumcised on the eighth day, and then she had to go another 33 days for purification. And on the 40th day, she would present herself at the tabernacle and, of course, later the temple and offer a burnt offering and a sin offering. If she were able, in other words, if she was wealthy enough, she would have, her burnt offering would be a lamb of the first year, and the sin offering would be a turtle dove or a pigeon. If she were poor, in the case of Mary, she was poor, she would instead bring two turtle doves or pigeons, one for the burnt offering and one for the sin offering. And that's what we see her doing. As Mary and Joseph were accomplishing the redemption, accomplishing the redemption of Jesus and Mary's purification, two people approached them. Both were very old. We know, we don't know exactly how old Simeon was, but we know that Anna was very old. She was well up, probably really close to 100, if not even over 100 at this point. Um, the first, like I said, was Simeon, and the second was Anna. Both had something in common in that they were both waiting on God. That's what the Bible actually says in verse 25, Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And in verse 38, Anna was looking for the redemption in Jerusalem. The interesting thing about these two phrases, looking for and waiting for, okay, is that both of these are the same Greek word. Under them, they're actually the same Greek word. And so they have the same meaning. And that meaning is waiting for and looking for, I mean, the meaning of waiting for and looking for is to wait in confidence, to wait in confidence. Usually, when we consider the blessings of Simeon and Anna, we focus on what they said, but today I want us to focus on the actions of Simeon and Anna, so specifically, they're waiting with confidence on God. Waiting in confidence on God or for God. We may have often read this passage, but have you ever considered the facts that Simeon and Anna were unusual? They were unusual. Think about it. It was the great temple at Jerusalem. There would have been thousands of people coming and going every single day, all day long, and potentially even into the evening. They usually closed the gates towards the, after a certain time at night, but they would have been coming and going all day long and even into the evening. And Joseph and Mary with their new baby were just one of many poor people that would have flowed in and out. As a matter of fact, there was probably multitudes, I don't know how many, but considering the size of the crowd that we know was in Jerusalem during this period of time, there was probably many babies that were brought in at this time for purification, both girls and their mothers coming to be purified, and of course, the boys being potentially redeemed if they were firstborn. Uh, you know, they were, they were unusual as they came in. They wouldn't have been something that would have been obvious. Everybody would have just thought, oh, they're just part of the crowd. It wasn't like they came in wearing big placards or something, you know, those big placard boards, you know, uh, see Jesus, the king of the Jews, you know, you can come over here and give me a shekel and I'll give you a peep at the, the savior of the world. They weren't doing anything like that. Uh, you know, they didn't have, uh, you know, some kind of weird hat on or anything like that. They were just normal people. And so there was nothing that would really attract attention to them. He was nothing to the crowd, or Jesus was nothing to the crowd or to the powerful people that were in control of the temple at this time. As a matter of fact, the only thing that he was to them was five more silver shekels. 
And I hate to say it, but that's just, we know from later on the way Jesus talks about what was going on in the temple, we know that's exactly how they were looking at him. He's just another income stream for the temple, okay? He wasn't there. They didn't see anything special in him at all. And yet, as he came in, you need to understand that to these two people, Simeon and Anna, he was the end of their waiting and the fulfillment of all their wishes and hopes that they had had through a long life. Waiting and wait is a word that is often used in the Bible. And if you read through your Bible, you'll see it come up many times. And it's used in several different ways. And I didn't go through every one, but in the early part of the Old Testament, it was often used in relationship to military or criminal activities, okay? This is dealing with ambush, ambushing an opposing side. And you know, if you're going to set up an ambush, you have to be someone who is very good at waiting. Trust me, you have to be really good at waiting. Okay, because if you're not good at waiting, you're going to give yourself away. <laughs> so, you know, you have to be really good at waiting. It also is used in relationship to service, especially dealing with the priests and the Levites and their service in the temple and the tabernacle. However, there are many verses dealing with waiting on the Lord just as Simeon and Anna did. They And I want you to think about this. We're going to cover three different things. The first one is they waited in faith. And I want to challenge you today about waiting on the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you something. We're going to go into a year this year. And I don't, I, I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet, okay? But I really expect this year to be a wild year. And I just say that because it's election year in America, and that affects the whole world. It doesn't make a difference whether you're American or not. It affects the whole world. We have literally, I, I was listening to the report the other day. They said right now, in the last, we have more wars ongoing right now than at any time in the last four decades. That means since the Second World War. There's more combat going on right now than ever before. The world is literally tearing its parts out, itself apart at the seams. And we don't know as Christians how that's all going to happen, how that's all going to play out and what's going to happen this year. But I want to challenge you about waiting, just like Simeon and Anna did. And the first one I want you to see is they waited in faith. Both Simeon and Anna waited in faith for their Savior. Both Anna and Simeon are described as good people we would say religious people. Yet their faith was not in their good works or righteousness. Their faith was in the promise God had given to, make, to, to redeem and save all mankind. Listen again to what Simeon in verse 30 says. For my eyes have seen thy salvation. My eyes have seen thy salvation. And Anna in verse 38 said this, she spake of him to all them that look for what? The redemption in Jerusalem. Not the redemption of Jerusalem, but redemption in Jerusalem. They had waited like all the prophets and saints of the Old Testament for this moment, and they cried out with David in Psalms chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. If you'd like to turn now, I'll give you a moment. Psalms 25, verses 1 through 3. Many of us know this because this is a song. We actually sing this as a song. And it goes like this. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. See, there are enemies. There are enemies. The enemies of Anna and Simeon are the same enemies that we have. Death and Satan. They had not stopped. Those enemies could not and had not and will not stop the coming of their and our Savior, Jesus Christ. They were not ashamed. What does it mean not to be ashamed? They were not ashamed meaning they had, they had not waited in vain. Their waiting was not disappointed. They were not ashamed. Nor 
had the waiting of the faithful of every nation been in vain, for God had kept his promise. Today we are waiting not for the Lamb that should take away our sins, but for our God and King. 2,000 years ago, he left us with the promise that he will return. His final words to us are, surely I come quickly. Just like in Simeon's and Anna's day, few of those who claimed to worship him were waiting for him. And you know what? Today, many people who claim to worship God are not waiting, nor are they expecting, nor do they really want him to come back. The temple, in the temple that day, everyone there claimed to be followers of God. And yet only two, only two were found waiting. Simeon and Anna. They were the two that were waiting they were the two that God told, here's the Savior right here that you've been waiting for. Christianity claims to be the largest religion in the world today, but I wonder how many would be found waiting, expecting Jesus when he comes. I want to challenge us this year. Let's be waiting for his return in 2024. Let's be waiting for his return. See, if we're waiting, it's going to impact our lives. If we're waiting, we're going to be serious about what we're doing because we're expecting him to come today. Let's be found waiting in faith. But number two, I want you to see they were waiting in obedience. In obedience. The testimonies of Simeon and Anna recorded in Luke tell us that their waiting in faith had an impact upon their lives. Their faith made them wait in obedience. Their prayer would no doubt be as David's, which we find in Psalms 25, if you're still there. Psalms 25, verses 4 and 5, it says, Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth. And teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day long. Luke tells us in verse 25 that Simeon was just and devout. That means he was a person who strove to live a righteous life. He was serious about God. That it, that's what it means to be devoted. A lot of people think, well, what does it mean to be devoted? It just means to be serious, okay? To be serious about what you believe. Not, not be just kind of, you know, oh yeah, you know, hey, it's great. I go to church once a week, you know, and everything's great. Listen, God wants us to be serious about who we have placed our trust in. He wants us to be serious about living for him. You know, he was not just playing at being a believer. He was living because he believed in God. Anna, the Bible tells us in verse 37, departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. These were people that were serious about their faith. They were waiting in obedience for the coming of their Savior. Are we waiting in obedience for our Savior? Are we waiting in obedience in 2024? Did we wait in obedience in 2023? Can I ask you a question? And this is a, this is a hard question to answer. And it's a, I'm not asking you to raise your hand or anything. But are you closer to God? In two, were you closer to God in 2023 than you were in 2022? Some of us can say yes. Some of us would say maybe not really. I'm just being honest because I've been a Christian for many years. And you know what? I've failed many years. But what I'm trying to challenge you to do is this year, look back and say, where was I in 2023? And now, let's go forward in 2024 and make a decision today that we're going to be closer to God than we were in 2023. We're going to be more serious about our faith. We're going to be more serious about our waiting in 2024. The final thing I want you to talk about today, we've talked about they waited in faith. We've talked about they waited in obedience. But now I want to talk to you about they waited in victory, in victory. The world of Simeon and Anna was not different from our own. 
Less than 70 years later, the temple they stood in would be leveled to the ground. The city they stood in would be utterly destroyed. The children that were born at that same time, some of them would have been old, but they would have still been alive potentially when that happened. In other words, they were living in a very tumultuous world. They were, they were, they were living under the domination of the Roman army. And literally, we know from history, we know that many people were rising up during this time and claiming to be the Christ, and there was large bands of people that were revolting against the Romans, and there was a constant warfare in this part of the world. And, that, you know, even within their own society, the, the, temple, the temple politics of that age was literally raging all around them. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all these, and the publicans and all the, if you read the history from that time period, it was no different than it is today. They were all out for their own piece of the pie. They were all out for themselves and trying to destroy everybody. And they didn't care who they ran over. You know, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? You know, things just don't change. And so understand that there was a lot of problems back there. And we see that Simeon speaks of this in verse 34 and 35. It says, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. He said that to Mary. He said that to Mary. He said, you know, you're going to have to suffer some pain. You're going to have to go through some difficulty in your life. He, he's going to, he's literally predicting the death of Christ, that he's going to be killed. And we know he was killed. They claimed he was, he was a revolutionary. They claimed that he was trying to revolt against Rome. They claimed that he was someone who was blasphemous and he was blaspheming the temple and blaspheming God. I mean, that's why they killed him. That's how they killed, they got him killed. So understand that there was a lot of chaos and there was a lot of problems, problems. But can I tell you, Simeon and Anna could wait in victory because they knew that God was in control. They knew that God was in control. They could pray with David as he did in Psalms chapter 37. If you want to look there, Psalms 37 verses 7 through 9. Listen to what David says. It says, He says this, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man that bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Can I tell you something? It doesn't matter what happens in 2024 in politics. You know what? It doesn't matter what happens in 2024 in the warfare that's being fought. We may be caught up in the midst of it, and I understand that. But can I tell you something? All of it does not matter because we know who is in control. And can I tell you something? This is all going to wrap up and it's all going to be done. And you know who's going to inherit the earth? It's not going to be the evildoers. It's not going to be those who reject Christ. It is going to be those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And one day this is all going to be over. All the pain, all the suffering, all the doubt, all the fear. And we can wait in victory because we know the end of the story. We know what is going to happen. And I want to challenge you as we enter 2024, it may seem that wickedness and war and all these things are in control. And it may seem that everything is going wrong. And it may be worse. I hope not. But it could. But this is the one thing I can say. God's not going to change. God is going to be in control. And he is able to take care of us no matter what happens. If it's our death, he can take us through our death. If it's our life through great misery and suffering, he can take us through. If it's through peace, if it's through wealth, God can take us through. You say, is there danger with that? Yeah, there is. There's danger. 
Because the worst thing you can do is become complacent when things become easy. But you know what? God can take us through all of it. He can take us through all of it because we can wait in victory for Jesus Christ. In 2024, I guess it's become my theme. It's going to be a year of waiting on the Lord. There's so many things I'd like to see happen. There's so many things that I'd like to do. But as I look out on the world, I say, God, I just want to wait on you because I don't know what to do. And I need you to help me. I want to be a person who's waiting in faith, waiting in obedience, waiting in victory. Now listen, it's good to talk about waiting, but it's better to act upon it. Now that may seem a little bit Strange to say that. You said wait, and then you said act upon it. Isn't that the opposite of waiting? No, it's not. Waiting, waiting is not just simply sitting around and doing nothing. Waiting is putting our faith completely in His hands and saying, God, guide me, direct me each step of the way. Jacoby didn't know everything I was going to talk about today, but his song that he chose that we had now heard hits right on the money, step by step. You know, in my life, I've learned a long time ago. I wish I could say I've learned it for good, but I've learned a long time ago that the best way to follow God and to wait on God is to take one step at a time. One step at a time, waiting in faith, Waiting in obedience. Waiting in victory for what He's going to do in our life. Not waiting in being all bound up, but waiting in confidence. Remember, it's waiting in confidence, knowing that God can take care of us if we will let Him. I want to encourage you. Let's go into 2024 waiting on God to see the mercy of the Lord in the land of the living. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. The only Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And Lord, I know in my own personal life, this is where I'm at, Lord. There's, Lord, I can be worried, I can be torn up, I can be focused on all the problems. But Lord, this year I want to be a person that's a Christian a believer who's found waiting on you. Just taking one step at a time. Lord, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we know that you know. Lord, help us to be waiting in faith. Lord, help us to be busy waiting in obedience. And Lord, help us to be waiting and not worried about what's going on around us, knowing that you have already won the victory and that the end will come And all this will be done away. And the only thing that will be left is just you and those who believe and put their faith and trust in you. I thank you for your goodness. And I thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.